Jacob's here to continue covering his tornado series and some of the most devastating or the largest ones, F5s in North Dakota. And there's only been two mm. on record going back to 1950, which is when tornado records began, at least reliably. And the two that occurred happened in the 1950s. The first one was Fort Rice, May 29th, 1953, with an estimated path length of 20 miles width of 600 yards and hit town around 8 o'clock in the evening. Two people were killed and 20 were injured. And then in 1957, the Fargo tornado, arguably North Dakota's most famous and deadliest tornado with 13 killed, 100 plus injured. More than 1,300 homes were uh, completely destroyed or damaged. And it was a part of a series of five tornadoes in the Red River Valley. But we're first going to start with the Fort Rice tornado, looking at the weather setup that generated this violent tornado. And Chauncey will explain that. That Fort Rice tornado was really what we would consider a classic springtime plains tornado setup. There was an area of low pressure that was moving across western South Dakota, kind of pointing up towards the Bismarck area, and there was a warm front that extended from that surface low pressure center across southern North Dakota. The temperature in the afternoon in Mobridge, South Dakota was 88 degrees, at the same time at Bismarck, 67 degrees. We had a lot of what we would call rich low level moisture, high dew point sticky air, even in the southern North Dakota. So even though the temperature at Bismarck was only in the upper 60s, the dew point was in the mid 60s. So it was cloudy. There may have even been fog around at the time. There was a distinct temperature difference across that warm frontal boundary, but there was still enough energy, even on the what we would call the cool side of that warm front, to fuel most likely a supercell thunderstorm. That's a really common pattern meteorologically for high-end violent F4, F5 type of tornadoes, and it appears that Fort Rice was in that position and that there was most likely a supercell that tracked along that warm frontal zone, probably originating in north central South Dakota. There's some evidence that there may have been a brief tornado near McLaughlin, South Dakota, and then later the Fort Rice tornado, the one that impacted parts of Morton and Emmons counties. That tornado crossed Lake Oahe. So you might have thought, you know, tornadoes, they're going to stop at the river. That's something many of us heard growing up. That tornado from 1953 is a great example of a high-end violent tornado that went right across Lake Oahe and it didn't impede it one bit. So unfortunately, pretty much the entire town of Fort Rice was leveled, including the Conception Catholic Church, where pews were jammed four feet into the ground, just showing the strength of the winds with this storm. To get that F5 rating, you had to have maximum sustained winds at more than 260 miles per hour. There are even some accounts of the only thing that was remaining of the church was the Blessed Virgin Mary statue. Now, this tornado occurred one day before Memorial Day, which was on May 30th back then each year. So the general store, half the school, 16 homes were destroyed, car parts were carried half a mile. This man in this photo that was published in the Tribune the next day ran outside the Fort Rice bar and hung onto a fence post to prevent from being blown away as the tornado hit. The Red Cross uh, helped uh, with the cleanup efforts and support after the storm, but the Fujita scale did not exist at the time. So they had to go back and assess the uh, damage looking at photos to determine the rating of F5. Now the scale didn't exist yet because it was created in part thanks to the Fargo F5 tornado on June 20th, 1957. So the 68 year anniversary of the tornado will be this Friday. Dr. Ted Fujita came to Fargo to study it and help to create the F scale. There was also the creation of terms, mesocyclone, the rotating supercell, wall cloud, because this storm was very visible and highly photographed, so that lowering from the thunderstorm is called a wall cloud, which then the tornado comes out of. So there was a, a many, many photographs of this storm uh, as it continued to track towards the Fargo area. And it was a part of a family of a few uh, tornadoes that tracked pretty much along what would become the I-94 corridor. But here's the setup for the tornado. There was an outflow boundary from earlier thunderstorms in northern North Dakota. That creates a lot of low-level spin in the atmosphere. And as that aligned itself pretty much east-west, that created enough low-level spin or shear to create for these violent tornadoes. And they were very slow moving, at times moving only 10 miles per hour while carving a path of destruction. And Chauncey will explain why that was the case. 
Well, in this particular case, the presence of that outflow boundary and this supercell thunderstorm with its really intense updraft, really tracking almost parallel to that outflow boundary, likely enabled it to stay in an environment that was very favorable for violent tornadoes over a long time period. When we look at the winds aloft, high above the atmosphere in the Fargo case, they were strong enough to let the ro updraft rotate, but not necessarily strong enough to really move the storm along like a block in a stream really quickly. It slowly moved along, stayed in an environment that was very favorable for tornadoes, and so multiple tornadoes developed along its path. Really the first tornado originating near Wheatland, North Dakota, a second one near Castleton. Fargo tornado was actually the third tornado in this family of five tornadoes that were very well documented, and it was the strongest one. There were two other tornadoes that then occurred in Minnesota. One near Glendon was actually F4 rated, so the actual supercell produced two violent, what we would consider F4, F5 level tornadoes that evening in June of 1957. We can also see in the tracks that very often and we see cyclical supercells is what we call them. These type of supercells that produce multiple tornadoes that near the end of their paths, they actually was sort of turn a direction, a much different direction than maybe the tornado was moving the rest of its life cycle. So in this case, the tornadoes moved generally eastward, but near the end, tail end of their life cycle, shifted northward, diminished, and then a new tornado would form further off to the east by some distance of miles. The tornado carved a path right through the center of Fargo, gradually moving east and then northeastward. The Golden Ridge area of Fargo is actually where the most intense damage was. That's where they classified it as F5 type of damage. That's where many of the fatalities actually occurred in the Fargo area. And again, homes were completely obliterated, actually swept from their foundations. That's the highest end classification that really drives that F5 rating. Since the tornado was very visible and slow moving, meteorologists were actually able to get the warning out that it was coming towards Fargo. I actually had an opportunity during the 50th anniversary of the Fargo 1957 tornado to visit with the Weather Bureau, which predecessor of the National Weather Service, forecaster that was on duty in Fargo the evening that the tornado happened. And they actually had what they called at the time as a tornado and severe thunderstorm bulletin. What we would consider today in today's world to be a tornado watch. That was issued probably about an hour and a half in advance of the tornado. But even more interesting is in that day and era, they were just starting to issue what we would consider severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings today, bulletins from the local office. And a lot, one of the main ways they did this was through an open telephone communication system that was two-way telephone that was with all of the local media. So the radio stations, the TVs, and they were live on the, with them for over an hour preceding the tornado. They were watching it from the observation deck at Hector International Airport where the Weather Bureau office was and doing almost a play-by-play -play as the tornado approached Fargo and they really had advanced warning of an hour or more that this tornado was coming to Fargo. It was highly visible. And people actually congregated at the Weather Bureau office to get information, but then many people drove away from town to try to not be impacted, but you don't want to be doing that. We don't advise you to drive away from the storm because you don't know sometimes how the tornadoes could track. So true, so true. So amazing. And, and, and many thanks to Chauncey at the Weather yeah. Service for those sound bites. And you put, Jacob does all this on his own. Yeah. And this whole it. series on your own free time here, whether at work or, you know, you're working extra hours. So thank you for that. A lot more coming up this uh, yes, summer more season. Yes, more tornado yeah. series in the coming weeks. It's going to be great thank to see.